Dear Muslims, do you rape female captives who are married? Do you condone slavery and rape of married women? Dear Muslims, would you rape female captives who are married if it was allowed, i.e. halal, in the Islamic Quran? Now we all know that the Islamic Quran is not the nicest of books. But what I came across a few years ago is so horrific that I used only parts of it and only the milder versions at that. But today I decided to take another look at just one, just one sentence in the Quran or part even of just one sentence and then analyze it a bit. Okay, so according to Yusuf Ali in chapter four, sentence number 24 goes something like this and it's about women who are prohibited to be married by Muslim men. So it says also prohibited are women already married, except those whom your right hands possess. Now what I read here is for a Muslim man, married Muslim women are taboo. Married non-Muslim female slaves are not taboo. It is lawful to have sex with married women. It can be lawful to rape a married woman who is a slave. Now, it's, it's hypocritical in my eyes, to say the least. It's immoral, disgraceful, and even despicable and horrendous for a book which claims it sets the moral standards for all human beings on the entire planet. And this goes for yesterday, today, and tomorrow to propagate both keeping slaves and having sex with them, even if they are married. So the number one thing I want to point out here, Islam does not prohibit slavery. Now, of course, Muslim apologists will not care about morality and the inhumane treatment of others, especially if those others are non-Muslims, the, the Kafirs, Kafirs. No, they will attempt to discredit the person pointing this out and then come up with the, I don't know, the same old tired excuses we hear all the time. You don't speak Arabic, it's out of context, it was revealed for a specific occasion, you read the wrong translation, it's not literal but allegoric, here it says something different, you don't understand the rationale behind it, you believe the universe came from nothing or it came by chance, and so on and on and on. Just weak feeble, primitive, and eventually insulting the person and not addressing the claim or question. Because, I mean, look, if there would be a God, right, and this God was perfect and wanted to create humans and intended them to do something, and then went and used human language and human inventions to distribute these commands, that God would be incompetent and a failure, not perfect. And that's why Islam needs humans to correct the mistakes in the old texts. But even, come on, if, if I ignore any logics or rational thinking processes now, there, there would still be a problem. If, if this were a perfect book, written and then dictated and revealed as a perfect book, this book would require no explanation. It would not require any context. And it would be valid in this version for all times. And it wouldn't address the specific situation that happened, I don't know, a thousand years ago. So either the stipulation in the Quran to attain salvation that followers may have sex with sex slaves who are married is not valid today, or it is valid today. It can't be a little bit valid. And there, there are no conditions or limitations mentioned in the text. But then, okay, maybe, just maybe I'm reading the word except and understand except when I see except. And maybe, just maybe, the word except does not mean or is not intended to mean except here in this particular sentence. Just as an example. Now, how would I verify that the words used are intended the way I understand them today? 
Well, let's go a bit deeper, shall we? Let's see if we can figure this out. Since I thought about this entire concept a few years ago, I eventually came up with the following approach, which is a sequence of processes. So what you do is you look up what words are used, check what ancient and modern Islamic scholars say about this and how they understand the words used in this sentence, and then go to the Hadith for verification. And if any of these elements disagree in some way or form, it is a reason to abort this. So, as I always do, let's first look at the words used in ancient Arabic, and let's look at them in Arabic. Anybody can read here who knows Arabic, it says prohibited, who are married, except the Ilah, whom you possess. Now that's what it says in the Quran, which was memorized by Muhammad, so the story goes, and transmitted to others and finally written down at some stage. And if anyone doubts any part of this, we can all doubt everything in the Quran, and where it says that everything is explained and it is easy to understand. But just to be thorough, let's check something else. Does the word except, the, the ilah, ever mean anything else in the Quran? No, it's always the same thing, except. So, next step, what did others, the experts, make of this? Do the Jalalains disagree with this? No, they concur and riot safe. They, they replace the accept those with, with save those. What your right hands own of captured slave girls whom you may have sexual intercourse with, even if they should have spouses among the enemy camp. That's very clear, I should think. Also, please note, there is no mention of marriage here, as the facade of marriage before sex is ignored when it comes to sex with slave girls. Al Kushairi is only worried about the legal aspects and that there is payment for the women the man has sex with, preferably a dowry, a payment to the parents whom you buy their daughter from. Al Wahidi also says that the Quran thus states, as a result of which we consider it lawful to have a physical relationship with them. No misunderstanding here. Ibn Kathir goes, uh, he goes a different direction. He explains the words used in the Quran and also says that a Muslim may have lawful sex with women, except those whom you acquire through war, for you are allowed such women after making sure they're not pregnant. How thoughtful of him to ask whether they are pregnant. Now I wonder if they nod, are they set free or, oh, don't worry, silly me. Ibn Kathir carefully examines the words and confirms what we've already found out, and then elaborates on the legal aspects of sex in Islam. He limits the sexual urges of men, but ever so slightly, saying, you are allowed to use your money to marry up to four wives and for the purchase of as many female slaves as you like, all through legal means. How convenient. How horrific. How contemptible, disgraceful and inhumane for the females who were treated like, like, like goats. But I'm sure there are vile apologists today, like the man with a hat or the man with a bow tie, who will now read comforting sentences like mummies have the paradise under their feet or give them from what he eats and wears, or famous last words, fear Allah concerning your slaves. And think that they have somehow cancelled out the horror in these kind of sentences in the Quran and the entire concept of slavery. I mean, it costs 20 to 100 million lives, depending on how you count it. And no, come on, a woman whose entire family was wiped out, who was dragged all the way to the Middle East from the English coast, did not have only one thing in mind, having sex with the man who bought her. It is a slave market, not a job fair. Oh boy. Anyway, then Ibn Abbas, let's carry on with this, he agrees word for word with what we have read in the Quran, allowing male Muslims to rape female captives even if they are married. Al-Madudi goes off and does something a little bit different. He performs a detailed analysis of what women qualify as sex partners if they also follow the Quran, that is. He does not address women and tell them who is even allowed to knock at their door, but addresses only the men. 
Even modern scholars such as Muhammad Taqi Usmani or Uthmani, they agree that this is what it says in the Quran and investigates whether it might have been abrogated, only to find no, it is valid today. Now, in Islam, there are interpretations which not only allow a man to marry and have sex with his own cousin and grandmother, but even his daughter, and in some instances, father and son can share a woman between them. In other cases and interpretations, this is prohibited. And he comments on who allows what sex with whom. Now, in my incest video, I've demonstrated all the different combinations possible in Islam in some detail. He then goes into whose property a woman is, what propriety rights they have over the captured woman. It is so sick, it makes you want to throw up what Muslims must tolerate. Now, this entire approach is a bit odd because it is the opposite of what we read what Muhammad said about this. Does that mean Muhammad was not a good Muslim? And none of the experts disagrees with the concept. So, thingy number two for me is that slavery and the rape of slaves is not prohibited in the Quran or the Hadiths for that matter. Now, is society and humanity as a whole superior and better than these Quran passages with their despicable and horrific contents? Should they be ignored or updated or maybe even deleted? So the next step is to check the secondary text, the Sunnah. What exactly does Muhammad say about this? Well, we can read that we captured some women who had husbands among the idolaters, so some of the men disliked that. Now, I can carry on and on showing hadiths which explain what Muhammad said and did and how he did not prohibit Muslims keeping slaves and did not prohibit Muslims from having sex with them, even when either of them was married. So thingy number three, Muslims can have slaves, can have sex with their slaves whenever and whatever and even if these women are still married. But then, what about all these more benevolent hadiths? Well, they contradict the others. And now a Muslim needs to figure out what they personally can accept and can consolidate within their personality, their morality and acceptance. It's down to the human. All these hadiths do is confirm that there are slaves and that Muslims can have slaves, and it is nice if they treat them nicely and even marry them. Does this type of slavery make slavery any better? Should a woman from a poor tribe really be grateful that a Muslim kills her husband, her brother, her father, wipes out friends and the entire tribe, and then drags her a thousand kilometers all the way to Damascus, rapes her several times on the way and then sells her to a guy who also rapes her and eventually marries her to have more sex and cover her when she is given permission to leave the house? Is that good for a human being? Is that how a human being deserves to be treated and should be treated today? Is that what Muslims think is the correct way of handling women? I think not. But it gets worse. You don't think it can? Believe me, it does. Because there are hadiths which show the full depth of contempt Muslims, and Muhammad in particular, had towards slaves, especially female sex slaves. Let me, let me try and elucidate the situation and the corresponding actions found in the following hadith. And these are, again, not obscure sayings, but coming straight from Muhammad and categorized as authentic, sahih, which is probably why we see this practice today by Boko Haram, Daesh, and all those who follow what Muhammad did. Because, come on, Muhammad plundered caravans and small settlements, stealing everything and making off with women and children after the men were massacred. The women were sold on the slave market. That's the way it was. I mean, Muslims went all the way up the coast of France and England to capture blonde or blue-eyed girls for the Middle Eastern slave markets. Because these girls would fetch higher prices than black or dark-skinned females would. Pregnant females were worth less as the outcome of birth was uncertain and the money would be wasted if she died in the process. That is the callous view 
of what was common in those days. So the men would try not to get the women pregnant and would have a guilty conscience if the women they were raping still had husbands who were alive. But Muhammad told them not to worry. Muhammad, the idol and the role model for millions and billions of Muslims living on this planet today. Muhammad told the men that they could rape female captives. Muhammad told the men they could rape female captives even if they were married. Muhammad even told the men that they should enjoy their orgasm when raping female captives who were still married and not to worry about their prices on the slave market. Only his Allah would decide who was going to get pregnant and when, so they could enjoy the rape to the fullest without any worries. And just so that you don't accuse me of lying, here's a selection of these hadiths, all categorized and verified as being authentic by Islamic scholars, showing what I just explained. Thingy number four is that according to the secondary texts in Islam, Muhammad advised his men to keep slaves, have sex with those slaves, even if they were married, and to enjoy the sex without worrying about getting the slaves pregnant, which would reduce their prices. Now, there are indications that some slave owners also kept male sex slaves, but I'll leave that for another day. So, dear Muslims, are you better than your God? Are you better than Muhammad? I mean, can, can you really, and I mean really, and with a long, deep look at your morals and your personalities, admit that you too think that slavery is okay? is acceptable today that buying another human no matter how well you treat them is good a commendable action do you think that human beings should be objects and that these objects can be used and can be used just for sex without any rights or mutual agreements are you really able to rationalize slavery by looking for nice sounding sentences in Islamic texts somewhere? Do you really think that if it says you should feed and dress slaves, it makes slavery better? Is Islamic slavery better slavery than other slavery? Come on, it boils down to this. Can you honestly and with a clear conscience allow a Muslim man, your neighbor or colleague, or even your friend or your brother to go out and buy a girl who is still married in her hometown and allow this Muslim man to rape her while saying your God is all for it? Do you really consider a man with a messenger or not? One who condones the rape of captives and still encourages this rape and the enjoyment of it as a role model in the 21st century? Without any scruples, do you seriously admire this man? If you, if you can really and with conviction say yes to any of this and still look for some sort of justification for any of this, I'm sorry, get off this planet. We don't need you here.